Hey, what's going on, Facebook? This is George. It is Friday, 3 p.m. Time for another live video. Boy, am I excited about this one. <laughs> anyway, um, let me see if anybody cares to join as I get comfortable and uh, try not to sit on the cable that is making it possible for me to hear myself. Anyway, um, if you're out there, anybody seeing this, anybody hearing this, um, send me a hello in the comments. Um, I hope I can see them. Um, it's not always here. Um, but anyway, I hope you're all well. Uh, let's see. I just got a notification over here. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, I hope you're all well. Uh, I know this week, I know for myself, this week has been a tough one. Um, and before I get into this week's subject, I'm going to have to get a couple things off my chest. And I hope not to do this every time, um, because obviously the systemic racism that is um, part of the U.S. is... Um, you know, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Nevertheless, um, the events of the last week have uh, once again shaken me to the core. Um, you know, for those who didn't know, um, we had a black gentleman uh, being gunned down in the back, being paralyzed for life, uh, for walking away from a situation that he was trying to defuse and we had a white teenager killing two people with an AR-15 um, protesting. Those two people were protesting against police violence. Um, he killed two people and he maimed one other. And um, so one gentleman, one black man walked away and got paralyzed, shot seven times in the back and a young white kid kills part of a uh, young white kid who's part of a right-wing militia kills two people two protesters maims one other protester and gets to walk home gets to go home and is being you know got of course arrested the day after but um, also got um, preferred treatment from the cops from what I understand uh, I've looked this up because I do want to make and 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 I I, I hear uh, or I see posts on social media um, about people on the far right uh, and perhaps also moderates um, saying that well he acted in self-defense and the only thing that I want to say about that is that I looked this up because I'm not a gun owner um, I've never even shot a gun. But I looked up the AR-15 or AK-15, whatever the fuck it is. Um, that particular gun is able to distribute, uh, what does it say, 600 rounds per minute. Okay, that is, that is its possibility. Okay, if it apparently it's also kind of vague, the information that you find about that. But when you do that, apparently, if you were to do that, part of the gun would melt or whatever I, I really don't care it translates into 10 rounds per second one round is enough to kill somebody uh, for those who even think about making the argument that he was acting in self-defense um, you go with that kind of firepower into a situation where your opponent is armed with a skateboard, you're not acting in self-defense. You are a stone cold killer. And that's all you set out to do. That's all you're ever going to be. Um, I don't believe for one second that uh, any reasonable person could make that argument um, but yet it's happening and this is 2020 2020 
we are here in the US um, and this shit is happening and it's a lot it's a lot to stomach my anxiety is through the fucking roof um, and as much as I do like making these videos um, and as much as I try to take care of myself and my partner um, it's getting real difficult and that is not to not to be underestimated so why do I share all of this um, mostly to let you guys ladies and gentlemen um, know that uh, you know as fierce as I might seem as bad as I might seem um, this shit affects me too and if you feel overwhelmed if you feel bad about feeling bad um, just know that you're not alone and I think that's important that's that needs to be expressed it's not being expressed often enough um, <laughs> yeah Lisa that shirt I know <laughs> I know well I had to wear it today I mean yesterday that asshole was talking so I was like you know what I'm gonna wear this shirt um, so I just wanted to get that off my chest there's there's no there's no way in hell that this this act of, of violence that number one the act of violence against a black gentleman uh, being shot seven times in front of his kids that that cannot be seen as anything but racially motivated and number two it there's no way that no way that this act of violence by this white uh, teenage asshole um, can be seen as an act of self-defense what is an act of say or what was a, an act of self-defense was Breonna Taylor's uh, boyfriend husband partner shooting at whoever was storming through their door late at night unannounced without knocking that actually is an act of self-defense and Brianna Taylor's um, partner had enough wherewithal to shoot into the floor because he was trying to protect him and his partner so let's be clear about what's what all right um i needed to get that off my mind i needed to get that off my chest as i said i hope that i don't end up doing this every week because i also have I, I don't want this to uh, i'm not i'm not a moral majority i'm not i'm not someone to to pontificate or, or preach or anything like that um, I do believe that you lead by living you lead by living and I try to live in a way that hopefully shows my values uh, and my beliefs um, my loves my likes my dislikes um, that's all I got right um yeah this is a tragedy this is a total tragedy and and uh, it breaks my heart having said that let me move on because i also have something to do here and that is to do a video and talk about stuff that doesn't break my heart um, I see that hey I get comments this is awesome so I see that I have some viewers which is really beautiful I want to thank you all again what's going on Sadi Marco Archibaldo Lisa um, I want to thank you all once again for tuning in and 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 spending some time with me I really do appreciate it um, I think this is you know one of the things that we can do for each other 
is spend some time. Uh, it's not a lot, but um, you know, if it motivates, if it inspires you to um, work on your craft, work on yourself, um, cool. You know, I'm just sharing my thoughts and my processes and my concepts um, to a couple uh, of a couple things with you guys in the hopes that um, you find it entertaining, enlightening, and as I said, motivating and perhaps inspiring. Um, and also, as always, big disclaimer, I am not a historian. So what you're going to hear today um, is not entirely um, backed up by historical data. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> it's backed up by um, my experience from being a musician for the past 20, 25, 30 years. Um, let's see if I have any more comments here. Oh, wow. Hey, Mary Pat, what's going on? I hope you're well. <laughs> I'm glad people like this shirt. I wore this shirt on a video that I did <laughs> recording um, songs, uh, and uh, I posted it to to various groups um, that were, you know, focusing on, on the instruments I was playing. Um, and yeah, it invited um, quite a bit of hate mail. Um, but hey, this, this does not physically hurt anybody. This is a declaration of what I believe and what I think of this particular individual. All right, uh, let's get into it. Um, as I say every week, um, in the description of this video, you're going to see uh, my contact info. If you want to reach out to me for lessons, for recordings, please email me at george at georgefarmer.com. If you want to contribute to the cause um, and want to donate, uh, there's some information in the description of this video as well. Uh, and you will also find um, uh, a link to a playlist that I curated uh, with uh, today's topic in mind, which brings me, segue, which brings me to today's topic, um, which is um, show preparation, episode 6b, stacks. And those who've been following these, uh, these videos, uh, the show preparation videos especially, um, Coming to number six was um, meant that um, I was talking about shows that had not made it to Broadway or that were in, in what's called a workshop um, environment. Uh, for those who don't know a workshop environment, what a show is concerned, that's the, th that's the iteration of a production before it, uh, it is uh, on Broadway or at an off-Broadway theater or perhaps at a regional theater before going to Broadway. Uh, workshop productions very often involve, um, you know, the sheer fact that the show is changing a lot, all right? Um, so, and with that come, you know, certain parameters that for us musicians um, kind of become necessary to adhere to, all right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So this particular one uh, was Stax. And um, what this production was concerned, uh, what came to my mind first when I tried to remember it, this happened uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I remember it being winter, uh, so it might have been... I I believe winter of 2017. Um, so November, December, it must have been November, December of 2017. I know that it was pretty cold. Um, and yet we had to learn this music from Stax, which is super hot. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, this was, by the way, and this is a, a small side note, this was the second show ever that I have gotten called for from a contractor. Um, with all the shows that I've done, this was the second show ever that, um, yeah, where a contractor actually um, called me to do it. Um, 
so just all the other shows that I have done, I have gotten through uh, word of mouth uh, via uh, composers, orchestrators, um, uh, conductors, um, so all of this. Hey, what's going on, Chip? Yeah, you know, George A is back. <laughs> what's going on, Carolyn Tiffany? Good to see you. All right. Um, so Stacks um, obviously dealt with the life of the Stacks record label in Memphis, Tennessee, right? Um, that label, I, I did write down a bunch of notes for today's video, so just bear with me as I consult the trusty phone. Um, as I said earlier, this week has been emotionally draining for me and it's difficult without notes to talk freely um, that's just where I'm at right now. Um, the label Stacks was founded by two individuals. Um, I know one of whom is still alive, and that's Jim Stewart, and his sister Estelle Axton. I don't know whether Estelle Axton is still alive, but I believe Jim Stewart is still alive, and he, he, if I got if I get this right, he is in his nineties. Um, and uh, my introduction to the music of Stax was via the band that recorded most of their music. And that band was, uh, that band in the studio was Booker T and the MGs, um, which consisted of Booker T. Jones, um, Al Jackson, Steve Cropper, and Donald Duck Dunn. Uh, Obviously, I I, 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 don't, I don't know whether this is obvious, but at least for me, my introduction to, to Booker, T and the uh, Booker T and the MGs um, was via the movie Blues Brothers, where Doug Dunn and Steve Cropper played in the band. Um, and uh, the movie also featured some of the music from the Stax label. So needless to say, when I got called to do this gig, um, I jumped at it. I mean, this this was great. I had yes, this was now that I'm talking about it. I do remember this was in um, November, December of 2017, and I had just finished a production of "Ain't Too Proud" in Berkeley, California, at the Berkeley Repertory Theater. So this fit perfectly into into my schedule, and uh, also in in a larger frame or bird's eye view, it it, it fit perfectly into what I love to do, which is um, really researching and going deep um, on music that uh, that I love, right? What's going on, Javier? Good to see you. Jackie Clark, your hometown heroes. I know. I know. Keep it alive. Um, man, Javier, I miss playing with you as well. But, you know, we're going to get this together one way or the other. All right, so... Uh, when researching stacks or I should I shouldn't even say researching because just like uh, just like with Motown I had with Motown um, I had a, a, a four CD set of, of Motown number one hits right and and it had pretty much all of, of Motown's hits uh, from the heyday to probably the 70s um, from its beginning to the 70s um so and i listened to that a lot now stacks i didn't quite have the same because um in the movie blues brothers they play some sam and dave songs every now and then and that got my attention the voices of uh, sam moore and dave porter um totally got my attention the songs those songs and once again and I've, I've talked about this many times already you hear these these songs and they sound like you've always heard them you and th there is no bigger achievement there's no bigger compliment in my book um to a songwriter or to a musician or to a performer um when you can achieve that when you can create a piece of music a piece of art that uh, to the audience feels like they have always seen that you know that in my opinion, means it's part of 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 a of, of a consciousness um, that 
these particular artists are able to tap into. And with Sam and Dave, with the music of Sam and Dave, I felt like I had always heard this. All right. So I many years ago, I bought a Best of Sam and Dave, which was a, a two CD set. And I still have it. Uh, and I listened to that extensively, not really realizing all the players that were involved. Um, not really realizing, you know, the, the history of Booker T and the MGs. Once I kind of got into it, it, you know, it opened up a lot of um, ideas and, 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 of course, made a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, let me just get back to my notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, where did I leave off? Uh, Jim Stewart and Estelle Axton. One thing that... that you will notice, and I don't know if anybody has been paying attention to this, but with every video that I make, I, I put out these these little flyers and, and pieces of artwork. Um, the various events have, you know, uh, covers. There's there's the the artwork that goes on on my Instagram fee uh, uh, posts about these videos, and when doing that, um, I did find this picture of. Um, of a recording session at Stax. And you see Sam Moore, you see David Porter, you see uh, Steve Cropper, I believe. Um, you know, you see the Memphis horns standing around what I believe is a piano, but may or may not be. Um, in other words, you see a whole bunch of dudes, right? You don't necessarily see a lot of women in these pictures. And that is something that I did want to acknowledge and did want to point out. Uh, because just like Motown, also the history of Stax, the, the legacy of Stax would not exist without two very, very important women adding and, and uh, working to make it happen. Um, and that was Estelle Axton and um, Gwen Gordy, uh, Barry Gordy's sister. So I thought that there was a very interesting um, parallel uh, development that both label heads, meaning Jim Stewart and Barry Gordy, went to their sisters to borrow money to get the label off the ground. And their sisters were kind enough and believed in them, in them to give them the money. So without these ladies, there would be no Motown as well. Okay, there would be, you know, as much as much emphasis as there should be on the creative output of the musicians. It also needs to be acknowledged that these ladies believed in these ideas. Okay, and without that belief and without that rock solid foundation in terms of financial foundation, you know, who knows what would have happened. But it certainly would not have happened the way we know it to be and the way it has um uh, influenced us. Jackie Clark is telling me Dave Prater. Dave Porter was one of the songwriters to do this. Got it, got it, got it. Well, pff, listen, I'm I'm sorry that I get I get the names wrong, and and I I do say that a lot. <laughs> like I mess up names all the time. Dave Prater was part of Sam and Dave. All right, not Dave Porter. Dave Porter was apparently one of the songwriters. All right. Um, having said that. I wanted to acknowledge that without these ladies and without the help that these ladies provided, the very real help that these ladies provided, these labels would not have gotten off the ground. Okay, um, and very often that is kind of overlooked, right? especially the contribution uh, of women to this music scene and to this American music, to this African American music, which is American music. That cannot be stated often enough. Well, thanks, Jackie. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, another thing that I noticed when when reading liner notes uh, for Sam and Dave was that another uh, songwriter was the great Isaac Hayes. And, and I had only known Isaac Hayes from the Black Moses period of his uh, output. I, it had never occurred to me that, of course, he had uh, a background before that, you know, and, 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 and he had a career before that. Um, 
but that is something to keep in mind for especially for people who are n perhaps not as familiar with stacks which brings me to my next point and that is and that was very important when 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 preparing for this show um, to really zero in on the difference between the various regional labels that have become canon in American music and that have become, you know, all influential. What are the labels I'm talking about? I'm talking about Motown, of course. I'm talking about Stax. I'm talking about Muscle Shoals. I'm talking about Fame, okay? Like, and, and many others. There's, there's, there's a fantastic book. Um, I should have brought it, unfortunately. I again, this week has been rough. <laughs> I did not have the wherewithal to get the, the, the influential books together. Um, there's a, 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 a great book that deals with, um, with these studios. Uh, it's not Behind the Glass, or is it called Behind the Glass? Uh, anyway, I'll put it into the description of the video um, because there are at least three books that I wanted to to uh, bring up. Um, anyway, so uh, there is very often when you're called for these type of jobs to play the music, you know, play what's called a jukebox musical, a uh, jukebox show, um, you know, this perhaps not the best name for this kind of endeavor, but um, truth be told, it does make a lot of sense. Um, so when usually when, when you get this kind of call, um, or very often it happens, I should say very often it happens with a lot of my colleagues that, uh, you know, there's no preparation, there's no homework that happens. Uh, Hey, we just had we just got joined by George Neha or Naha. I hope I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Who was the guitar player of that workshop? Um, and I'm gonna get to 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 a very very funny story in, in just a second. Um, coming back to the preparation, uh, I believe that it is very important to figure out and acknowledge the difference of output, the difference of sound, okay? Um, Aretha Franklin did not record for Motown, okay? Uh, the Swampers, and again, I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of names out there right now, and, and you everybody who's listening to this or who's watching this will have to do some homework on their own. The Swampers did record for Fame and then for Muscle Shoals, which they owned and which they still own the studio. Uh, who are the Swampers? Uh, studio musicians who first recorded for the Fame record label, the Fame studio, and then, you know, broke off and started their own business. Um, the Booker T and the MGs were not part of Fame and were not part of Muscle Shoals, all right? And I'm, uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, stating the obvious right now, but you would not believe how many times um, I have heard the comparisons. Oh yeah, Diana Ross. Yeah, uh, when she recorded down uh, in Memphis, Diana Ross never re recorded in Memphis, at least not to my knowledge. All right. Um, oh yeah, this this uh, respect is, is is a Motown song. No, it's no, it ain't. <laughs> it never was. <laughs> so my point is, and I hope, I, I'm of course, I'm being facetious, but my point is specificity okay um, all of these regional the uh, regional uh, studios and productions production entities had a very distinct sound because that's that made them money at the time this this is not like today where today we all have our own studios I know I do um, and I can pretty much dial in one sound or another back then um, these musicians definitely um, distinguish themselves by having their own sound and that's what distinguished the f various productions okay um, that's why an Atlantic production does not sound like a Motown production all of that all right what's going on Ted Gould man I would have 
I wish I had known I would have brought some potato chips just to show to you. But here we are. <laughs> also, uh, speaking of, of regional <laughs> regional theaters, or sorry, regional um, studios, I just saw Ted Gould, my friend Ted Gould just joined us, um, who is, uh, who grew up in, in New Orleans, this uh, totally famous studio in New Orleans um, where the, stu the, the, re the, the studio musicians were, were the, the famous, the funky, um, the meters, who later became the funky meters. So, um, you know, all of this needs to be uh, taken into consideration, in my opinion, and, and all of that helps me um, to produce or reproduce uh, a somewhat authentic sound. And now I'm getting to George Neher, who was the guitar player at the, the workshop of Stax, and who, from what I understand, has actually worked with some of the of the MGs, uh, with Steve Cropper, and, and who had done work with Doc Dunn. Um, and I don't know, George, if you're if you're listening to this and if you're still with us, maybe put that into the comments because uh, I don't I don't remember whether you worked with Booker T. Yes or no? Just let us know. Anyway, we had great times because um, his name is George and my name is George. So every time the MD would yell out George, we would both answer. Um, and, um, you know, drove the MD crazy. <laughs> At the time, <laughs> we, we basically, you know, did that a couple times. By the time he finally got to the one he needed to talk to, he had forgotten his, his point. So it helps to have, you know, a fellow musician in the band who has the same name. It's always, 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 always uh, a benefit. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, good times. That was, that was really, really awesome. Um, anyway, coming back to, to Stacks and the preparation that, that went into this. Um, so, I hope I, I made the point clear that all of these regional studios have their, had their own sound and still do, okay, because some of them are actually still active. Um, some of them have been turned into museums, which I think they should. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Vienna, Austria, uh, where you can't go around the corner without seeing a plaque on some building. This famous composer used to live here, or this famous, you know, piece of work was composed in this building, you know, at this. So, you know, it, I think it's important that, that these, these, um temples of sound these temples of sound which is by the way the name of the book that i intended to bring um these temples of sound these studios uh if they're not active anymore or maybe they can stay active but they should become museums and and really you know show people the cultural uh legacy and heritage of the united states because that's what America has to offer to the world um, in a positive way. Um, so, all right, George Neha says that he hasn't worked with Booker, but he did work with, with Cropper and Dunn. Yeah, 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 awesome. So if you anybody out there wants to check out George Neha, please do check out, also check out uh, Jackie Clark. You know, you can find them in my friends list. Um, these are really, really important musicians who, who are keeping um, legacies alive, right? Um, and that's important to do. Check out my friend Ted Gould, because uh, he's badass. He's really badass. Um, and has helped me tremendously uh, gain uh, a, a, an even bigger admi admiration uh, of the New Orleans sound, by the way. But I'm getting totally sidetracked. So coming back to the preparation for for this show i hope that i have established that all these reg regional the uh, regional studios have and still have their own sound and in order to reproduce that um it did help to kind of 
go deep and start looking at articles and, and st of course listening to music and transcribing some 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 of the songs and there was one thing that i definitely noticed and that was a, a striking difference to to motown now with motown um you know as is depicted in the movie standing in the shadows of motown a lot started with jameson with the bass player um you know they had like a rudimentary hum harmonic structure and um basically uh producers would rely on jameson to kick something off or to come up with some sort of groove and then everybody else would fall into place right now with stacks that was not exactly like that uh from what i understand and also this was um i really should have brought these books with me um booker t jones has a great biography out uh which uh, i'll put the title of it into the description um it's it's very recent so for a lot of of the music either he or whoever was composing sometimes it was isaac hayes uh or whoever brought in the songs and then um Booker D. Jones and the MGs started playing them. And basically, from what I understand, their process was not necessarily based on one individual kicking things off and then, you know, taking basically taking that and running with it. No, they came up with their parts together. And the one analogy that always comes to mind is a cooking analogy. Um, Basically, when you make soup or, or, or stock, I should say, you put all the ingredients into a pot, you put a lot of water into it, and then you start reducing, right? Reducing means uh, cooking the water down. Um, what happens is that all the, the essential oils, all the vitamins, minerals, and whatnot of the ingredients go into the, into the water. Um, the more you reduce, the stronger the flavor becomes. And that to my you know limited knowledge was the best analogy that th that i could get for how booker t and the and the mgs worked they started with a song and then they started rehearsing it oh my friend leo smith is telling me time is tight my life note by note booker t jones's autobiography great book um so when you hear the music of booker t jones and the MG Booker T and the MGs, you hear the the product that is, uh, you hear a product that is completely reduced to its bare essence. Okay, um, and therein lies the difficulty in in reproducing it because it might seem as if, yeah, the note count might not be as high, um, the lines might not be as difficult because there are fewer of them. Nevertheless, the uh, the intent that went into coming up with those particular lines is very, very, um, very strong. Meaning that they basically came to that conclusion after leaving everything else behind. All right, but that means that they had to play everything else first to come to that conclusion. Um, and that that's all of a sudden because everything else ends up in the phrasing okay at least to my knowledge to my ear so when you hear duck dunn playing eight notes um you actually hear all the lines that he had played before but it's all distilled down to this one note and to the to the steadiness of this one note and that's the fact that it's all distilled down is what makes that particular note and his output so steady okay um also so uh the the style of 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 booker t and the mgs at least to my ear and to my aesthetical sense um was quite different to motown okay uh there was just um <laughs> words fail me sometimes when when i try to explain that but um it was basically something that was very well crafted um due th through 
the process of elimination, right? Um, and that was something to keep in mind. And what does that mean now in terms of, of reproducing the music? Well, it means really knowing the music note by note. And we did notice that very, very quickly because, um, you know, sometimes somebody would play something else and it immediately didn't feel right. Uh, so at least to my, in my opinion, it is, it is so important to get this music down note, f note by note first. Now, if you want to leave it there, uh, sure, you can do that. If you want to embellish on it, after knowing it inside out, um, that's a different story, all right? That's, in my opinion, that, that makes it now, now we're going into the territory of interpreting something. Um, and that I find interesting because all of a sudden, if, if you really have done the homework and know it down cold, um, all of a sudden you find yourself uh, playing in the style of somebody, in the style of a Duck Dunn, in my case, you know. Um, George Nea ended up playing in the style of Steve Cropper. Um, so that, it takes that kind of, in my opinion, it takes get that kind of commitment to really get this, this sound under your fingers and, and in your, in your, hopefully in your brain and hopefully in your heart, right? Um, so let's see. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Doc Don, um, one thing always comes to mind when, when I listen to, to his playing. Number one is his enormous sound, the way they recorded him. Um, you know, he definitely takes up a lot of space in the frequency spectrum of any Stax recording. Um, you hear him very, very well, right? And as I said in, in previous videos, I believe that th the louder you play, the less you play, the more difficult things get. Um, so try reproducing that um, and being accurate about it. And, you know, with the understanding also that the less you play, the more exposed every note is, okay? The louder you play, the more exposed every note is. Um, try doing that. I, I highly recommend that. On that note, I also recommend... Um, especially when it comes to Stax music, uh, actually not writing it out, uh, but learning it, uh, memorizing it and learning it by ear and, and not slowing down the tape or, or whatever the medium might be. Um, I got this uh, concept from, from Yannick Gristaler from one of his videos on YouTube, or I know that I was part of, uh, I, I had uh, subscribed to his um, channel, uh, to his website for some time. And he's a big uh, believer in writing stuff out in the moment, you know, without slowing it down. And I had never done that before. Um, with Stacks, I did that. Um, and I, I perhaps took it a step further by not writing it down, but memorizing it uh, and not slowing it not slowing the, the, the files down. Uh, and the funny thing about it is, is that it does go in deeper. So it's, it's a great, I highly recommend Stax music, aside from the pure pleasure that you get from listening to it. I, it's a great tool for ear training. <laughs> it's, it's so nerdy. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> so, um, Hold on, my cable to my emails is constantly getting caught back here. All right, um, another thing, what we, we, another important point in my opinion is when, when dealing with Doc Don, this becomes very, very clear, uh, very fast. Uh, there is this asinine discussion and, and argument that is being made uh, in bass player circles, and I believe that this is happening in every instrument, in every, yeah, instrument, instrument circle, in every vocal circle of uh, musicians being, you know, either virtuoso or a team player or a groove player or whatever, whatever the fuck people call that anyway. Um, I do not believe in that. Um, 
you you cannot tell me that uh, a duck done was not a virtuoso. You cannot tell me that a family man Barrett was not a virtuoso or a Ray Brown. Uh, you cannot tell me that uh, a Billy Sheehan is is a more proficient musician than than um, Jack Bruce or 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 Sting. Okay, that whole differentiation between virtuoso and groove player that's garbage that is entire garbage and it's it uh, i i can only i can only say that once i got rid of that distinction for myself in my head um my playing became more open right and and i was more open to take more information in and all of a sudden, I didn't have such a hard time transcribing or learning a solo, um, playing fast, uh, playing slow, uh, playing loud, you know, being exposed. I did not have that hard of a time with being exposed um, once I got rid of the distinction of virtuoso versus groove player. It's total garbage and it really needs to go. Um, I'm always, I'm also always reminded, and this is a side note. Um, of of what Marcus Miller says about that and 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 his uh, answer to that question is very easy. It's like you have to be both. End of story. And I did um, I, the reason for also why I'm bringing it up right now uh, when thinking about Doc Dunn is is I actually saw them live. I saw Booker T and the MGs live at the now no longer existing BB Kings. Um, this is a couple years ago, and from the first note, the the groove, the pocket was so unique and so strong, it, it just it just engulfed you and it just um, it grabbed you like nothing like nothing else. Um, and um, you cannot tell me that that is not um, uh, a representation of virtuosity, okay? It's a little bit like I believe that last week I had that uh, I I did talk. Ab it, it was either last week or or, or two weeks ago. No, it was two weeks ago when I talked about Erica Badu's album, and um, the book um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where the writer of the book uses the entire book to define quality. All right, and and I believe that um, you know I used it two weeks ago when talking about Erica Badu's album, but also now th the output of Booker T uh, and the MGs, that is quality, right? And that's virtuosity right there. So, you know, does it, does it jive with the idea of there being a lot of notes and very quick runs and, and, and all of that? Who cares? <laughs> it's there. It's quality. Everybody hears it. Everybody feels it. M even more importantly, perhaps. So that is that is important. That I wanted to get out there. That that was one takeaway that was very very that just became very clear very very fast. Also, and coming back to to when when we played that workshop, um, it 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 sort of. Um, I was at the time I was you know heavy into into my Jameson research and and all of that. So I had a l I had a lot of notes kind of going in and out of my my mind and in and out of my head at the time. Um, and then all of a sudden you you start learning uh, the music of stacks where there are less notes, but the intent behind the notes is just as uh, fierce and as dramatic and as strong. Um, you really start appreciating the virtuosity that it took to make that music. Um, so very, very important. Uh, here's another, so just to, to, to button that, um, or actually I said that already. Um, yeah, I already said that. I, I made myself a note um, that, uh, you know, people very often think that this style of music, the style of stacks, because there are less notes, less melodies, less runs or whatever, um, that is somewhat easier. 
and I can't help but when I when I'm confronted with arguments like that, I can't help but think like, dude, you're completely missing the point of what this music is about, uh, and you're completely missing the point of what what it means to make music. Um, so if if there's any any big takeaway from from working on stacks and preparing that show, you know, don't don't underestimate what it takes to come up with a good part and really try playing that part before doing your own thing. Um, not that there's anything wrong with doing your own thing. It's, you know, also you n need to keep in mind where you're coming from individually and, you know, how much um, experience, how much uh, background you have in that particular music. For someone like Jackie Clark, who lives in Memphis, it'll probably be a lot easier or he'll be quicker in, in coming up something that's that's stylistically correct um, than somebody like me, all right? Because I'm not in that environment and I have not, you know, been in that environment my entire life. So, you know, things are different for different players, but I know that for, for me, um, it took all of this this research and all of this homework to kind of get to the point where I was like, okay, I got this style down. Here and there, I'm gonna I'm gonna change something. I'm gonna I'm gonna move a little differently. But I know exactly how this style goes. I know what this is supposed to sound and feel like, and therefore it makes it possible for me to perhaps adapt it. And this is where it kind of ties in with preparation for a show because inevitably when you are preparing a show you're going you, very seldomly you play the song as is recorded right this the first thing that usually goes is form <laughs> because people don't have you know you don't have all the time that it takes to play the entire song beginning to end so you kind of need to come come to the you need to have it distilled down to its essence and then you're able to speak and play authentically um, and correctly um, in a in a particular style so um, and with that comes of course the understanding that these parts cannot necessarily be exchanged for something else um, and and this is where you know every now and then you do get when you're a freelancer and when you're lucky enough to get called for these kind of jo jobs, um, you do get uh, presented with a, with a situation that can be frustrating because um, very often then the argument is presented, oh, well, just do something, you know, or play something or, or you know, it doesn't really matter. It's just a, a low frequency. Nobody really is paying attention. And I don't, I don't believe that that's true. I believe people are paying attention and uh, I believe the audience is paying attention that, that the singers, the performers who have to represent the songs, no matter what they're doing, they are paying attention. They know the songs from, they know their, the, the, the emotional impact that the songs have um, from learning the material. They need to feel that emotional impact in order to sing the song while dancing, acting, moving across stage you know getting out of the way of of scenery etc cetera, etc cetera. everything if you do something else in my opinion that becomes distracting all right so it really does the i guess the point that i'm making over and over again i know that i'm repeating myself is um really learn this music uh inside out uh understand that booker t and the mgs came to these parts by way of distilling everything down to its bare essence. So honor the work, respect the work that they've put into it. Um, if you want to, exp if you want to um, speak that language, so to speak. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, one thing, another thing that um, I thought was perhaps um, that really helped me um, with that at, at the beginning of this video the quickly approaching the one hour mark at the beginning of the video I, I was talking about um, having a, a best of Sam and Dave right 
Um, that was not the only Stax album that I had. And I have a couple now. Uh, but the other one that I have was the Stax Vault Review Live. Uh, I believe the concert is live in London and the date is sometime in the 60s. There are two volumes out. I highly recommend getting both of them. Um, it has a, a roster of Stax Vault artists, um, including Sam and Dave, uh, the great o Otis Redding, um, Carl Thomas, and... Uh, Eddie Floyd, um, and of course Booker T and the MGs, um, the Memphis Horns, I believe, I'm not 100% on that. Uh, so that particular tour, uh, again, this is where my lack of hi history uh, is, is somewhat of a problem. But I it is my understanding that that was the introduction to the introduction of this type of music, aside from what people heard on the radio, to an to a European audience, and uh, the the cultural impact of that tour, together with the Motown review, um, also in the '60s, cannot be over overstated. Um, I think that. Um, you know, these these tours kind of made it possible for young European audiences to have an idea of what this music sounds like, what it looks like, what it felt like live. And uh, I think that changed the way people uh, approached life, to be honest. This, I know that I'm sounding preachy or, or perhaps a little high and mighty, but I, I do believe that the cultural impact was that strong, all right? Um, there had been, of course, um, a an introduction to the blues uh, via traditional blues artists like a Muddy Waters, um, like a Willie Dixon, um, a Buddy Guy, um, like all of these artists, Bo Diddley, uh, all of these artists had gone over to Europe they found an audience there. An audience found them. Um, it's not, you know, goes. It went both ways. Uh, but then, you know, did they have as much of a draw as an Otis Redding? I don't think so. And that is not taking anything away from Muddy Waters or, or what I think. You know how important I think he is. Um, so the great Bill Graham writes in his uh, in his autobiography, Bill Graham Presents, he believes that um, Otis Redding paved the way for the acceptance of, of, of Jimi Hendrix in Europe. Um, and not only on a musical point from a musical point of view, but also as as an admirable um, sex symbol, uh, which of course was important, all right, and which sold. So Otis Redding being up there and singing his heart out um did something to an audience and opened the door um i think that's that cannot be underestimated and and, and overstated um i think it's important when listening to the live album from from the stax vault review <coughs> excuse me listen to al jackson the drummer uh that is Textbook is another word that, that often comes up when thinking about stacks and all of these, these um, labels. That is textbook for whipping a crowd into a frenzy. The way Al Jackson played the drums, um, I would not be surprised that he went through several uh, snare drum heads a night. Um, maybe I read that in an article one time, entirely possible. but. It's so strong and it's so forceful and yet at the same time so dynamic um, and and it's it's high art in my opinion. Um, so check that out. Listen to Al Jackson. I, I I believe that from the group Booker T and the MGs he gets the least amount of credit maybe because he passed away uh, first. Um, but I also believe in. Again, I might not have this right. I might not have all the details right, but 
they had a they had and still have a hard time um replacing him because they couldn't find anybody who who was that type of player uh i also believe that al jackson was a total originator um and this might seem strange that me a bass player is talking about a drummer but i mean that's the closest that we have on the bandstand most of the time um but i believe that that al jackson was a total originator of 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 modern drumming um I don't think that that anybody played like that before him. Um, I, if I'm wrong, please, you know, bear with me and prove me wrong. I'm, I'm totally happy to to hear different opinions about that. But that is the takeaway that I get from his playing. Needless to say, that Booker T and the MGs, uh, Booker T Jones, period, um, Steve Cropper, period, are are both such strong um personalities on their respective instruments that they have become their playing themselves ha have has become textbook um same goes for duck dunn uh, but for whatever reason in my opinion or at least from what i see al jackson doesn't necessarily always get the same amount of credit and i think he should get the same amount of credit um so let's see what else can I tell you guys about this? Um, I did cover the difference between the various labels. I think that cannot be overlooked. That's very, very important. Um, once again, Motown, Stax, Fame, Muscle Shoals, um, the label in New Orleans, um, the Columbia Recordings. Uh, check out the book Temples of Sound because uh, it deals with all of these particular particularities that came with with these labels and I know that it has helped me a lot um, there's a great book out called what duck done um, and uh, that deals with uh, uh, transcriptions of his style of playing it has various breakdowns in terms of um, equipment that he used he's known for uh, playing precision basses I believe most of the time without the foam mute um which is an incredibly nerdy thing to say but all the bass players out there will appreciate and understand what that means <laughs> <laughs> um uh I, I believe steve cropper's his main instrument was um uh was the telecaster um and let's see, George Neo says, Cropper to this day says Al was the greatest drummer he ever played with. Well, there you go. I mean, and he was there. So I, I, I can only concur. I can only agree with that. Um, I think that he, he was one of the greatest drummers that, that we had ever heard, period. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, Oh yeah, one thing that I wanted to to perhaps put into everybody's mind, and that is that we don't have that many originators of style in in terms of musical styles. We don't have that many originators around anymore. And I was very lucky that I made a point going all the way back to Vienna to see a B.B. King live, to see a Ray Charles live. Um, and in, in the same vein, I went to see Booker T and the MGs. I highly recommend that once this pandemic is over and hopefully some sort of live music will, you know, come back um, around, I highly recommend if, if these players are coming to town, let's just let's just all go okay whatever you're doing whatever gig you're playing is not going to be that important in comparison to hearing these musicians um and it's that's that's i know that's a hard thing to say you know because i don't know the financial situation of everybody listening or hearing this i know my financial situation you know sometimes perhaps doesn't make it uh, possible but let's just make an effort to support live music and especially um, 
these players that we are having fewer and fewer. I I I wanted to um, <laughs> I wanted to also share this moment uh, with you all, where um, I remember the day uh, Donald Duck Dunn passed away. Uh, I was. I was in upstate New York. I had just done the night before. I had done a gig with Suzanne Vega, um, and I was leaving to come back to to New York City. Um, and on the bus, I checked my phone and I probably logged into social media, and there I saw the news that Doug Dunn had passed, and and it floored me. All right, it it I I definitely felt the loss. Um, and perhaps this was the reason why it's so strong in my memories. Perhaps this was the first time that that uh, it actually meant something. You know, up until then, you do hear the news of this musician passing or that musician passing, and and you admire their output. But for whatever reason, with Duck Dunn, it became real to m for me, um, and. Uh, that kind of definitely just opened my eyes to, or my mind to, let's just let's just try to support these musicians, these originators of style and 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 originators of music, while they are still around. I think that's very important, and I do understand that we musicians, as I said in previous videos, um, we are only a small part of 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 a larger audience, but we are definitely part of a larger audience. So let's also use our financial power to buy tickets for concerts of of these originators. Hey, what's going on, James Edward Alexander? Good to see you. Um, that, that is something that I just wanted to, um, I wanted to deposit with, with, with all of you watching and hearing this. I think it's, it's very important, your, your soul, um, is is elevated by hearing uh, these great artists play, um, as I'm sure most of most of uh, of this audience um, knows anyway. So, I think that's it for me for today. Um, I hope my rambling once again has proven to be uh, you know insightful, entertaining. This is what kind of went into the work for Stacks. Um, a lot of detail, a lot of understanding that conceptually this music, uh, the way they played this music was a product of uh, a process of distilling it down to its essence and then sticking with it and really really not moving from that. Um, I think that's that, that was, that was a major takeaway for me. Um, perhaps I was, you know, ignorant to the fact before working on stacks, on the musical stacks, I was ignorant to the fact that, uh, you know, how much it took for them to, to get to that point. And and lastly, and certainly not not least, um, one thing that I wanted to point out as well was that, um, just like. Jameson, Jameson's roots that are from the Gullah Geechee culture and environment in South Carolina, um, it is important, and in, in especially nowadays, where we have police shooting unarmed black citizens, uh, where we have white vigilantes shooting protesters, um, it is important to note that Booker T and the MGs was one of the very first racially mixed bands um, in an environment where race music was still uh, was still being upheld where uh, black musicians were not able to even share the airwaves uh, with uh, with white musicians where Jim Crow laws were still being um, adhered to okay uh, I think the impact that um, 
these uh, musicians and who they were and, and their backgrounds and all of that and the fact that they came together and made this music and it's standing the test of time, uh, that cannot be over overstated um, as a way forward especially. It's important to realize that this is our way forward that whatever division is coming from the White House nowadays, from the Republicans, um, is not a way forward. It's it's the ant it's the anti <laughs> antithesis um, word is not coming to me. Difficult word. Uh, it's the exact opposite. That's what I intended to say. It's the exact opposite. It's not going forward. It is not building anything. It is destroying everything. That's what's happening. Um, so, you know, take it for what it is, but I believe that Booker T and the MGs um, being racially mixed is a way forward for us as, as citizens, as Americans, as um, humans. Um, that's just, that, that is the only way. We are all the same. We're all different and we're all the same. So I hope I can leave you all with that thought. Um, I hope I can leave you all inspired and or motivated to go deep into the styles of this, um, of the style of this music. Um, and also, it doesn't have to be stacks. If it's if your thing is Muscle Shoals, then by all means go with Muscle Shoals. If your thing is Fame, go with the music that came out of the Fame record studio. Um, if your thing is Motown, then go crazy. Um, if your thing is the studio in New Orleans where the meters recorded, then by all means go deep there. It's uh, it's incredibly beneficial as a musician, um, and I think it goes even a little further than that. Um, because this, this, this quote of Charlie Hayden comes to my mind all the time. Um, you know, you can, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm probably doing a terrible job. Um, you try to be a better person, maybe you become a better musician. Um, in some way, it made sense to me to be a better person by doing research by going the extra mile um, and through that I became a better musician and I continue to become I continue to evolve as a better musician so I hope that uh, uh, you can take these thoughts and do something with them <laughs> um, that's as I said earlier that is it for me um, I will not apologize for what I said at the beginning of this video, what the current political situation is concerned. Um, I don't apologize for my beliefs, period. Um, I certainly will not apologize for wearing this t-shirt. And I encourage you all to buy one as well. Um, and uh, I hope... Um, Oh, here's the, here's the quote. If you strive to become a good human being, then maybe someday you can become a better musician. There you go. All right. Thanks, Bobby. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I do want to leave you with um, what's happening now in September. Uh, I will only be doing two videos in September, one at the beginning in the first week and one in the last week. Um, I... I have to go to Detroit to do some work there for in, in for those two weeks in the middle. Um, but the videos that are coming up uh, on September 4th, I'm doing one in, and the title is The House That Tom Barney Built. So I hope you can all check, you know, um, see if you can join me. Uh, I think it's going to be a really cool video. Um, and I'll talk about uh, a gentleman who has definitely influenced my trajectory and my life quite a bit. Uh, and then the second video, um, which
which is going to be September 25th, uh, is about Sting. Sting's Bring On The Night, the movie and the album. Um, just like Erica Badu's Baduism Live, which was kind of a real important album for me in the 90s, uh, Sting's Bring On The Night was a huge influence on me. And I'm, I'm not the only one, I'm sure. So I do want to talk about that, and I want I wanted to make a video about um, that inf the influence of that particular movie and album on on my you know at the time teenage mind, <laughs> but which is you know that that influence is still going on. It's that's that's just what it is. It's the, that that changes you know your path. So um, as I say every week, I hope that you all get got some good information out of this um i love working on on stacks uh that, that, um, there was a, a brief moment in 2018 where the product where the, the show got a production in dc and uh timing would almost work out where I, I might have been able to do the the production of stacks in baltimore and then do a production of ain't too proud in DC at the Kennedy Center, it didn't happen. It didn't happen that way, but man, that would have been sweet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think this is it for me for today. I hope um, I hope you all stay well. You hope you all stay safe. I want to thank you all for sharing your time with me. I want to thank you for contributing to the cause for donating. I do appreciate that, and I, I highly recommend checking out the the playlists that I put up in the description of this vi of these videos. Um, I also got the question whether these videos can be seen, and you can either find them on Facebook, uh, or if you don't want to do the whole searching, you can find them on my YouTube channel. Uh, so please go and subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's uh, a ton of stuff there um, that will only grow over time all right um and as always um i want you all to keep in mind to stay safe stay be kind be cool and remember that we only have each other all right i'll see you all next week later